I was awakened by the clattering of impervium on the deck plates. I jerked my head up and squinted in the direction of the noise. A tall trooper was clipping his rifle into the center rack at the back of the row on the opposite side from me. His dropped bucket was slowly rocking on the floor at his feet. It was scarred with a single blast mark singed across the left eyepiece. I closed my eyes, squeezed them tight and opened them again as they adjusted to the light streaming in the rear hatch. We were in a hangar bay somewhere. The DL-997 cargo loading droid switched off its shoulder-mounted flood lamps as it finished securing a supply crate further back in the hold. It then retreated down the inclined ramp into the hangar bay outside. It was then that I noticed a modified version of a two-legged at Saint just outside. I lifted my bucket up and flipped on the chin switch for the navigational pane as the new guy stowed his gear. The tiny display showed a rotating Star Destroyer schematic and flashed the name. Leviathan, immediately to the right of that display, a star chart snapped on and rotated, then closed in on the Talus sector. I had only been sleeping a short time. The Talus system was not very far from a note. I glanced back at the new guy and nodded in his direction as we momentarily locked eyes. He nodded back as I spoke. I am Deckard. TD-2187. Welcome aboard, TD-6829. Topolev Mayevkin, he said as he shoved his bucket back under the jumpseat beside his bag. He sat and fastened his restraints as I had, with a heavy breath and closed his eyes. Dessert trooper. I thought, as my eyes slowly drifted shut once more. The boarding ramp raised and the hatch sealed. I was spiraling back into my dreams as the engines roared to life and we streaked away from the Leviathan, asterisk asterisk asterisk. After calm linking to the harbormaster. Falker finally found his ship. It sat dwarfed between two enormous ships, on one side by a superstar destroyer that was being gutted and refitted and on the other by a heavy freighter, a new arrival that was busily being unloaded. He had been on some small transports before, but this was probably the smallest, and definitely not the shuttle he was expecting, but rather a small cargo transport, already loaded down with caged livestock and farming supplies. Taka. D. Drag. Dans and 1265 were all focusing their attentions around the Resolute Servant and a squad of intriguing TWI Lek dancers from RHENVAR. They stood amongst crates and supplies, playing with their leku and smiling as they talked with the eagerly assembled troops. The ground crew was busy unloading the rest of the ship's cargo. There were crates and livestock everywhere. Among the deliveries were several caged asalamari for delivery to the office of the emperor, along with hundreds of ch hala trees to be planted in the main chamber of the Grand Corridor at the Imperial Palace, hey guys. IMTD 1344. Danlin Falker. Is this thing my transport? The others laughed and the TWI Lex smiled as Taka spoke up. Hello 1344. I am minus 2953 Takas. Taka, and yeah. This little thing is our ship, looks like we got the aromatic section, Falker shook his head and closed his eyes as the pilot walked down from inside. Is this the guy? Taka looked up at him. Yeah, this is the guy we were waiting on. Let us get the rest of this gear loaded and get out of here. He turned back to the dancers. Sorry ladies, it is time for us to head out, asterisk asterisk asterisk. It was dark and quiet where we were, in the cargo hold, save the constant high-pitched whine of the engines. I was unstrapped and watching our slow approach to a small planet with several moons in close orbits. We had navigated around the fringes of a moderately sized asteroid field and now finally we were passing through a thin, vaporous cloud band of cosmic dust. My helmet navigation panel flickered to life, throwing off a bluish glow inside. I turned and glanced over at it in the darkness, sitting on the floor in front of my gear bag. The blue glow was reflecting off the metal deck plate from under the black trimmed edges of the bone white, armored helmet. There was also a faint glow visible through the dark eye lenses creating an eerie, ghostly appearance. I slid out of the gunner s seat and knelt on the cold deck, lifting it up to see what it had to offer. As I rolled it over and peered inside, the information display screen was populating. Raltir was the name of this place. I glanced into the back of the hold. Topolev was still asleep. I moved back to the gunner's chair, holding my helmet and looking once again through the port. 
We followed a path that carried us through bright bands of warming light reaching out from the central star in this system, silently streaming through the heavens to finally filter through the translucent veil of dust which surrounded us. Our approach eventually moved us beyond the reaches of the orange starlight and into the eclipsing shadow thrown by the planet itself. High above the portion of the surface that was covered in the liquid darkness of night. Then, like a stalking predator in the shadows, the lights of a silent, circling, darkened star destroyer suddenly appeared out of the camouflaging darkness of the endless starfield as we cruised past heading for the base on Raltier. Faint lights on the planet below flickered, twinkled and grew brighter as we entered the atmosphere. Immediately, the smooth ride of the shuttle was interrupted by the jarring turbulence of the air, now buffeting against the wide flat wings and the hull of our craft. From the direction of the cockpit I heard a crackling request for security code clearance. There was a lot of interference, as if someone else was transmitting on top of our military frequencies. There were moments of coarse static bursts, and then garbled words and electronic tones streaming over the ground crew transmission. The pilot complied, sending out the ship's electronic signature. As he did so, an information screen appeared on the other end of the comm line in front of the ground crew member at the base displaying our ship type and specifications. Moments later as the static disappeared from the comm channel, we were cleared for landing at the base. The pilot switched on the forward projecting approach lights and adjusted his thermal sensor settings as our ship descended blindly into a thick fog. I could see nothing, just swirling clouds. Then faintly. I saw a few lights and finally, the barest of outlines of several buildings and towers. They were only visible as slightly darker shades of grey against the white mists of the dense fog. The extended gear touched down in a small designated landing zone near the southern perimeter of the expansive spacefield. Topolev was awake now too, and we both unclipped our harnesses as the pilot powered down the reactor and the engines fell silent. We must be staying here for a while, I said, standing. Topolev responded, looking around the hold as the wall-mounted, battery-powered lights kicked in. It certainly looks that way, as he leaned over and grabbed his bucket. I picked mine up too, and walked the corridor toward the rear ramp and the spacefield outside. Topolev stepped into the aisle in front of me as the pilot came down from the cockpit. Hey Deckard, how s the ride so far, I laughed. Not too bad. Riggs, if you like the smooth. Core system refinement of a snobby commercial liner pilot. I ducked as he threw his gloves at me, laughing. I had known Riggs since I had been assigned on a note. He was flying the shuttle that had delivered me and the others to that swampy, mudhole of a planet. It was fitting that he was the one flying me out of it. He jokingly shoved me into Topolev as he spoke. Oh, I am so sorry. He backpedaled and pulled away as I took a mock swing at his head. Topolev laughed and moved out the hatch, stepping onto the ramp. There was a deafening blast and a violent rocking of the shuttle as an expanding fireball washed over us and we were thrown backwards to the deck. The lowered portion of the ramp we were on had exploded, shredding and twisting the plank into a mangled ruin. We were under attack. Suddenly we weren't laughing, we were scrambling for our clipped-in rifles, and pulling our buckets on. My ears were ringing from the blast and my heart was racing. Topolev, you okay? I yelled. Yeah. I am fine. I am going to need a new chest piece, though, as he indicated a hand-sized piece of shrapnel from the ramp partially embedded in the impervium. Riggs reached up, pulled a DLT-19 from one of the crates and powered it on. Smoke poured into the ship and sirens blared as another, stronger explosion rocked it, throwing us across the hold into the wall and scattering us on the deck. One of the main rear landing gear assemblies had been hit, and the heavy shuttle groaned and listed to one side as the damaged gear folded and collapsed beneath us in a tangle of bent, stressed metal. The wing-mounted dual repeater cannon on the damaged side spewed a shower of sparks and suddenly opened fire, spitting non-stop, repeating blasts of energy beams horizontally across the landing area, sawing through the tops of the gray tree outlines on the fringe of the clearing beyond. The adrenaline was coursing through each of us as we tried to get an assessment of what was going on. None of us could see through the smoke or the fog for that matter. I yelled to be heard over the explosions and blaster fire occurring outside. If we stay in here much longer. Somebody's gonna be pulling spare armor parts off our dead bodies by morning, Topolev switched on his thermal imaging and scanned the spacefield outside. You're right about that. 
There are no nearby targets. Though, must be snipers. The firing is coming from beyond the edge of the field. There's a troop transport speeder we can take cover behind just outside and to the right, if we can just get to it. Switch on your thermal imaging, a blaster shot from across the field vaporized a hole through the twisted surface of the ramp just in front of Riggs' unarmored leg, and he yelled. Well, we can't stay here any longer. Let's go. The three of us charged down the remnants of the ramp and leapt to the Duracrete deck, blasters firing. We stayed clear of the repeating cannon blasts, still firing into the darkness of the trees. Several blasts crisscrossed in front of us from the cover of the thick, mist-laden foliage. Troops now streamed out of the base buildings on the far edge of the field, running across the paved surface firing red, blue and green blasts of superfocused energy through the fog. I heard the moisture in the air vaporize as I squeezed off several shots. We all threw ourselves back first against the armored transport, as several waves of troopers joined us, firing on an unseen enemy out there in the mist. Who's shooting at us? yelled Topolev. One of the base troopers took cover with us behind the transport, blaster rifle raised up beside his head and breathing heavy from his sprint across the field. They're rebels. They've been under surveillance since we arrived here. We suspected that sympathizers were gathering here with friends on the High Council. Now we know, and he fired off several shots around the rear of the transport. I'm 4120, welcome to Raltier, he stood and ran off the edge of the landing pad into the grass, joining a group of other troopers, his repeating rifle blasting away at anything that moved. Topolev and I looked over at Riggs. He was armed, but not armored. Riggs, you need to stay here. You have no armor. No protection, I said. He nodded and waved us on. I went around the rear. Topolev around the front of the transport, firing as we ran to catch up with the base troops, with rigs providing covering fire. We jumped over the corpses of several troopers that had been cut down in the charge as another explosion rocked the shuttle behind us. I glanced back as I ran. She was now lying completely over on her side. When we reached the edge of the trees that lined the clearing, many of the troops were pursuing the fleeing rebels into the dense, foggy forest. 4120 was following a group of about six rebels that had broken off from the main group and had disappeared down an embankment. We broke left, following him through the tall, damp grass down the slope to a dry creek bed. The scurry of footprints in the dirt led away to the left, and we ran to catch up. We came around a bend in the miniature ravine just as 4120 blasted a gaping hole through the torso of one of the rebels, throwing her to the ground in a lifeless heap. There were several others lying on the ground with similar wounds. The two remaining fugitives fled wildly into the woods trying in vain to escape their deaths, yelling at each other. Where was he? He was supposed to be on that shuttle. We blasted into the darkness at them. Topolev took one out, and when his comrade turned to look back at his friend. I took him out too. Then there was a moment of silence, and the thick smell of ozone. Faint blaster fire could be heard echoing through the woods and then silence. 4120 set down his rifle and then pulled off his bucket, as he turned to examine his injured left hand, which was dangling from the end of his armored forearm gauntlet. I pulled off my bucket. Are you okay? He cursed in Iridonian and then answered. Yeah. I am fine. A shot just grazed me, as he grabbed the spinning hand and pulled it off with a quick jerk. Grazed you, said Topolev. 4120 held it up for us to see closer. Thin metal guides and wires protruded from the charred black skin surrounding the wound. It s okay, it s cybernetic. He saw the question on our faces, and stopped us. It s a long story. Suffice it to say I got a, uh, nasty infection and had to cut off my own hand before it spread. We slowly nodded and spoke at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Sure. He slapped Topolev on the shoulder. Come on, let us head back, smoke rose from the corpses lying in the sandy creek bed as we turned to make our way back to the base. It was beginning to grow lighter as we stepped out of the thick grass onto the landing pad. A group of droids were extinguishing the fires on the shuttle. Other maintenance droids working on the ship must have disconnected power to the rogue cannon, as it was now silenced. As we drew nearer, we saw Riggs sitting on what remained of a wing, being attended by a medical droid. You okay? What happened? asked Topolev. The injured pilot looked up. I am okay, but one T be flying anytime real soon. 
The cannon must have overheated. The droids are telling me the firing mechanism jammed, causing an explosion. I felt something slap me across the back and knock me off me feet. I tried to reach up to the transport to help myself up, but I couldn't raise my arm. When I looked over at it. Part of the red hot gun nozzle was sticking through my shoulder. That s it there. He said, pointing with his good arm. The medical droid raised one of its arms, showing us the discolored metal pipe held tight in the pincers. Luckily, the thing was so hot, it cauterized the wound immediately, otherwise. I'd be dead, I knelt down beside him. Take it easy. Riggs. They ll fix you up, and you ll be flying again before you know it. He nodded as I stood, and the medical droid continued its work. Topoliv and I stepped past them and climbed over the twisted metal into the hold. The ship now lay on its side, everything blackened from the smoke. We climbed over the bulkhead, which was now the deck. Our gear had been thrown toward the sloping nose. I moved forward and grabbed a bag and a pack, checked them, threw them to Topoliv and then grabbed mine. Mu-40 there LL take good care of you. Good sedatives. Ha, 4120 was saying to Riggs as we made our way out of the wreckage. After he looks at you. I am gonna need a tune up myself he said, holding up his severed hand. The med droid's head servos swiveled his optical sensors around to inspect the damage, then it spoke. Again. 4120. The dirtied base trooper laughed. Come on guys. I'll find you a place to stash your gear until we get a new transport. I am out of here with you when you leave. My transfer came through two days ago, and I think you guys are my ride. The Mew, medical unit, and another droid were loading rigs onto a repulsor sled as we headed toward the base. It was almost light now, and through the light mist, running along the far side of the base. I saw a river. The waters were quiet and calm, flowing along as if nothing had happened, completely unaffected. Great. I thought to myself, more water. I can t wait to get out of here. Asterisk. Tiny wisps of white smoke curled up from 4120's wrist as the med droid carefully removed the cauterized remains of the charred, synthetic flesh with a low-powered energy beam. 4120 watched closely as the droid cleaned the wrist stump with a jet of water, until all traces of the cybernetic hand were gone, save the guide rods, ball joint and multiple flexor cords sticking out from the durasteel cap that covered the end of what was left of his arm. The droid swiveled to face him. 4120, soak that in this container of bakta while I prepare the new prosthetic. The trooper complied as the droid swiveled again to a case on another bench. It released the small clasps on the front of the small, metallic crate and lifted the hinged lid. Inside were six compartments for identical synthetic hands. One of the compartments was empty, most likely for the one that had just been destroyed. The droid gently retrieved one of the remaining five hands and closed the lid of the case, securing the clasps. It swiveled around to 4120 and brought the hand up before his face. You only have five left, including this one. The trooper chuckled, trying to keep a straight face and not knock over the bakta. I am not joking. 4120. I want to be there to fix you from now on. Your record shows that you are transferring out to another group. You will need to watch me carefully as I reconnect these fittings and wrap the synthetic flesh, so you can do it in the future the next time you do this to yourself. And yes. I know there will be a next time. The trooper laughed again, as the droid put down the hand and raised the soaking stump out of the bakta. A jetted appendage extended from the shaft of the droid's arm and air was blown over the stump to dry it thoroughly. Once finished, it lifted the hand and positioned the socket over the ball joint on the stump. A release pin was pulled out slightly, and the socket slipped down over the ball. When it was confirmed to be in place, the pin was released, snapping back into place as a retainer, keeping the socket from slipping out of its new, seated position. The droid then set to work attaching the flexor cords to the tiny connectors on the structure of the hand. 4120 was watching closely. He knew all too well that he would be doing this to himself someday. I turned away from the transparisteel panel and walked out of the doorway, down a small corridor and lay back on my assigned bunk. Topolev was asleep in the one beside it. I closed my eyes as I waited for 4120 to be finished. 
Riggs was undergoing surgery, and would most likely be fine, but he wouldn't t be taking us on the rest of our flight, that s for sure. We would need another ship as well. My head was pounding. I couldn't stop thinking about the rebels who had attacked us, wondering what their objective had been. They had expected someone else. Had we gotten in the way of something? Our shuttle arrival, with two troopers of no consequence would hardly warrant an attack the likes of what we had just seen. 4120 walked in as I sat pondering the events of our arrival. He was rubbing his wrist, and flexing the new hand. I just heard that our task force leader, Lord Tian, has arranged for another shuttle. He is pulling a pilot familiar with some of the destination ports from field duty now to take us the rest of the way on our flight. Lord Vader will be arriving soon to inspect the interrogation camps. That was it. The rebels must have been expecting Vader instead of us to have been arriving on the shuttle. We had walked into the middle of an assassination attempt. Sever the head of the rancor and the body dies. But surely they couldn't have thought the Emperor would have been traveling with Vader. I realized 4120 had continued talking as I had drifted deeper into my thoughts, drowning him out. I had missed most of what he had said, but he was still talking. And Tian has just received new intelligence that shows a dignitary will be arriving later today for a meeting with the High Council. They were eliminated when we stormed the council chambers. I am sure Tian will want the visitor brought here and detained for search and interrogation. The Mu-40 droid moved past 4120 and placed the case of cybernetic appendages on his bunk along with another case of medical supplies and tools. Take care. 4120. Take care, and it turned and left. 4120 shifted his eyes from the new hand to me. I'm hungry. Let's go get something to eat, I nodded, it had been a while since I had eaten real food. I roused Topolev from his sleep and we followed 4120 out of the barracks and down a corridor to the mess. We each grabbed a tray and began selecting food as we spoke. So how long have you been here? I asked. 4120 spoke without looking back. About 45 of the local standard days. We were brought in when it was discovered that members of the High Council were rebel sympathizers and allowing rebels to assemble here, gathering their forces. Raltir is a technology-driven society. He put a hot plate of steak on his tray and licked the thick sauce he had spilled on his finger. We were given specific instructions to strip their technology from them and leave their world in ruins, begging for the mercy of the Empire. Tian was all too eager to comply, to the very letter of our orders. We sat at a table facing a large pane of transparisteel overlooking the landing deck. I had followed 4120's lead and taken a plate of the meat. It was very good and tasted like a dish I had once tried on Sicarpus IV, near Mimban. Topolev had a large plate of exotic-looking, multi-colored vegetation. Well steamed. I could see troops patrolling the perimeter of the deck, watching the woods, blasters at the ready. Our shuttle wreckage had already been cleared from the field. Topolev spoke with a mouth full. How's the hand? 4120 nodded as he chewed and swallowed a mouthful of steak. Perfect, see. He said as he flexed the fingers in and out twice. On the deck outside, a shuttle similar to our own landed as we continued eating. Several of the ground crew attended to various points along the undercarriage as the front ramp lowered to the ground and a passenger walked down and exited, a passenger in a black helmet, black armor and robes. Lord Vader had arrived on Raltir. I continued eating and watched as he was escorted into an armored speeder, being taken to review the interrogation camps. Asterisk. Above the surface of Raltir, a consular ship was making her approach when TIE fighter escorts appeared from the far side of the planet and intercepted her. They surrounded the ship as communication was finally achieved with the lead TIE pilot. TIE squadron leader. This is Captain Ramus Antilles of the Tantive IV, acting on behalf of the Royal House of Alderaan. We are en route to Gralia Spaceport on a diplomatic mission for a meeting with members of the High Council and are not to be detained. The Thai pilot responded, Captain, you will not be proceeding to Gralia Spaceport, as it now exists only as ruins, as does the High Council. You will follow us to a newly established Imperial base for search and interrogation. This system is now restricted. Immunity or not, by order of Lord Vader and Lord Tian. 
The TIE fighters crossed the nose of the diplomatic ship as she adjusted her course headings to follow their lead toward the new Imperial beacon being sent out from the impromptu military spaceport below. Antilles worried about the cargo they were secretly transporting for the High Council. They were loaded down with field surgical units, medipacks, medical, droids and more. If the ship were to be searched, asterisk. 4120 secured his personal items and medical equipment in the large, standard-issue gear bag like mine. Topolev was making a few adjustments to his new chest plate when a scout entered the room. Your new shuttle's ready, guys, outside, ready to go, Topolev grabbed his bag and bucket as did I. And 4120 made one last sweep of his bunk area before he slung the bag over his shoulder and the three of us made our way down the corridor, past the communications room and out to the flight deck. It was almost dark. The local days were a lot shorter than what I was used to. We boarded the shuttle and secured ourselves and our gear as a duty-scarred Corellian corvette prepared to set down on the far side of the deck. Her Thai escorts had left her now, as she lowered herself to a landing. None of us even noticed her arrival as the rear hatches on our shuttle closed and pressurized. The new pilot lifted off and we climbed once more toward the massive expanse of the stars above. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Our new pilot. Lieutenant Tank, H-A-D-N-T been very forthcoming with any details of our extended flight plan. About the only thing he had said was that our course was being dictated by Imperial Command on Coruscant as we flew, so there was no hope of using the hyperdrive engines. We had to remain in contact with them. He was very young, a recent recruit that, for whatever reason, HADNT made the cut as a fighter pilot. The kid had skills, or he wouldn't t be flying a shuttle, he'd be cooking in the mess. He had plenty of time to grow into a fighter pilot. Flying this shuttle was earning him good flight time experience. Even if that training meant we spent a lot more time in flight than necessary. We had been en route at sub-light speeds for what seemed an eternity now. Tank came over the comm with an announcement. We've a just been directed to make a course change and head to Denon Station. It s only a small deviation. Their SA freighter on its way there from Coruscant with five troopers that need to connect with this flight, 4120 rolled his eyes and Topolev shifted uncomfortably in his seat as I rubbed my temples. This flight just kept getting better and better. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, Denon Station turned out to be quite a beautiful place. It was situated in a sparse belt of asteroids orbiting near the planet Denon, not far from Corellia, near where the Corellian Way and the Hydean Way intersect. The series of stations had been constructed around a central core of asteroid. Having docked some time ago, we grew impatient as we waited on the freighter from Coruscant. 4120 and I sat with buckets off at a small table overlooking our shuttle and the landing bays below as Topolev waited at a window for our food. 4120 put down his drink and stared out at the adjacent station and the darkness of the stars beyond. I put my drink down and asked him. So, are you going to tell me about cutting off your hand? What really happened? He shifted a bit in his seat, and then spoke as he rubbed his left wrist. It has been quite a few years now. It started with a trip to visit my TWI Lek girlfriend's uncle. He had been called in to help decipher ancient Iridonian artifacts unearthed on a dig expedition near the Great Pyramids there. I had been called in to recover a specific piece for the huts, Topolev walked over with our food. I turned to him. He s explaining how he lost his hand. Please go on. We started to eat as we listened. We made it to Iridonia without incident, and located her uncle. I was amazed at the items they had recovered, ancient battle armor, early vibroblades, several jeweled bowls and an odd-looking book of flimsies which predated even holocrons. Her uncle had identified it as an early Sith writing, a book bound in rank or hide and written in blood. It detailed burial rites, funerary chants and other Sith rituals used for laying slain masters to rest. As we all know, with the Sith, there are only two. The ancient Sith Order were many in number and were narrowed by greed and their quest for power to only two, a master and an apprentice. This book chronicled the lives and deaths of the ancient Sith masters and contained many of their secrets. We were in the main tent of the dig one evening. My girlfriend and I were looking at the artifacts as her uncle read through several passages he was translating. 
As he carefully opened the yellowed pages, he uncovered a small compartment buried in the center of the book, but as he opened it, he was consumed in a white light. Without thinking, my TWI Lek rushed to grab the book away and help him. She was caught up in the blaze. I reached out to stop her and it started into me as well. I let go of her and watched helplessly as they were both incinerated and turned to dust. It was only then that I realized it was eating into my hand. I grabbed one of the ancient vibrocutters on the next table and severed my hand at the wrist to keep the reaction from spreading up my arm and avoid dying. With the vibrocutter I closed the book and the reaction seemed to be stopped. I noticed a small cargo ship landing below on the platform not far from our shuttle as he spoke, but I kept my attention on him. I cinched my wrist and gathered the book into a small container, sealed it and fled. I wasn't sure what to do.